Today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search specializes in helping small law firms in Texas hire lawyers and build great teams. So if you're thinking of making a move or your law firm is looking to hire, please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Hey everyone, Daniel Hare back with you on Lone Star Lawyers. I hope you and your family are both healthy and safe. Before we get into this episode, a quick reminder that Varsity Search has been retained by Hedrick Kring, a high-end litigation boutique in Dallas, and we are looking for a two- to five-year associate attorney. And this role will spend a significant amount of time representing major accounting firms in litigation and regulatory investigations, as well as a broader business litigation docket. So if you're in a large law firm or maybe another litigation boutique and are ready to start taking depots, second chairing trials, all while doing sophisticated work with other talented lawyers, this might be the right fit for you. So if you or someone you know might be interested, please go to varsitysearch.com slash lawyers or our Varsity Search LinkedIn page. The job's posted there at each location. You can also email me, daniel at varsitysearch.com. All right, today we are once again in Houston. I think this is three in a row, (laughs) where Wesley Lotz is our guest. Wes is a 15-year trial lawyer who represents clients in business litigation and arbitration. Wes graduated summa cum laude from Baylor Law School and began his career at a large Houston firm before joining the boutique firm that has since become Fulkerson Lotz, where he is a partner. And we recorded this conversation mid-April, so keep that in mind when we discuss the COVID-related matters. All right, with that, let's hop into our conversation with Wesley Lotz on today's Monday Mentors episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Well, we are joined right now by Wesley Lotz. Wes, thanks so much for being with us. Good to be with you today, Daniel. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I know it's a crazy uh, uh, time right now for all of us. Uh, I do want to start off by just uh, hearing from you a little bit about what's going on in your office related to COVID-19 and kind of how you've been responding to that. Um, what's going on with your within your firm and with your attorneys and staff? How are you all managing right now? So our our office is open. We're continuing to do uh, regular legal business, but because in Harris County, we have a stay home order in place, uh, pretty much all of our 12 employees are working remotely from from home. And we are lucky we have kind of some tech set up that allows people to access their work computer from home and get on email and use our document management system as well. And so people can still get things done, but it definitely has slowed down the pace a little bit in terms of regular activity. Sure, sure. Uh, have you um, had to or found there's some unique ways to to connect with people and to make sure people are staying connected to everyone through the different tools that we have? Or, um, you know, obviously, it's an extra special effort probably to do that <laughs> these days. So uh, I'm not a huge fan of lengthy conference calls, but we do try to do kind of a Monday morning meeting that's firm wide using Zoom to be able to video conference with employees to have them log in by a laptop or be able to kind of see a face in addition to hearing a voice. And we try to use those to coordinate what's going on in cases for that week and make sure that we've got appropriate staff support and can kind of coordinate on items. And then Uh, The other tool I've really used a lot, which I'm a big advocate of, is a product called Agile Law, and I use that Hmm. for uh, depositions I'm able to take remotely. So last week, I actually had a remote deposition with a witness in Illinois and lawyers in three states where everybody was able to connect using Zoom for video, but then the Agile Law product is really good at managing the exhibit, so you can display a deposition exhibit to the witness and opposing counsel at the same time and mark it digitally and have a file stamp that you can use to kind of keep business going on that side. Wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned it. So it's a, it's, it's not um, integrating with Zoom, it's, so, or it's, or it's separate. Uh, Correct. So you use yeah. Zoom for the video piece, and then yeah. this product, Agile Law, uh, uses uh, the software to basically sync the witness with your computer. So if you're the lawyer asking yeah. questions, you show an exhibit on screen, and then they can log in with a unique nine-digit pin, and the witness can see the same page or the same document that you're viewing, and their lawyer can see it at the same time as well. 
Wow, that's great. Well, I'm glad you mentioned it. Thanks for that. Um, and uh, staying on that, uh, it sounds like you've at least been able to do a little bit of uh, from the deposition side. Um, beyond that, uh, what's uh, been able to proceed, uh, even if uh, virtually or electronically, in terms of litigation processes, hearings, that kind of thing within the court system there in Harris County? What's been going on with that? In Houston, pretty much all of the hearings and trials have been canceled for the month okay. of April and really into May. Uh, we have, I think, our next hearing date is in Fort Bend County in, in the early part of June. But I think most courts have been very cautious about making sure that you don't have 100 jurors showing up for jury selection in the middle of a, a pandemic. And so they've kind of erred on the side of caution. There are a few courts that are a little bit more tech savvy that are holding hearings by Zoom or remote video conferencing, but really judge dependent on, on who's doing that. And really the big change for practice has been that most hearings are being conducted uh, more by submission and decided on the written papers right now as opposed to getting people live down there in court. Right, right. Well, and something we've always known that the written piece of it was really the most important most of the time anyway, and now it's becoming the only thing. <laughs> that's right. And that, that's yeah. kind of challenging if you're an advocate because you like to yeah. stand there talking and not yeah. uh, just turn it in a, a written brief. But I think judges are working hard and their court staffs are as well to at least try to keep the discovery part of cases going and you can exchange documents and, and written discovery and maybe take a month or two breather and then hopefully be back at it. Do you, and I want to ask you about your clients and kind of as a lead into that, um, do you get the sense from either clients or even opposing counsel that there's more of a, a desire to maybe do settlement type conversations or pushing towards that? They know that the actual trials or hearings are going to be down the road. Does that kind of uh, get everybody going towards trying to find some other solution? We've seen a little bit of that just from the perspective that clients are facing bigger challenges. And when you're focusing on the health of your employees and, yeah. and people, then sometimes the litigation fights take on a little bit of secondary importance. The big driver, though, is when I'm on the plaintiff's side of a case, the way I get a defendant to settle is normally we're close to trial or a month before trial. And you're looking at scheduling a mediation and the defendant finally realizes that they either have to face some music at trial or you know write a check to pay. And, and that's been delayed a little bit with the delay in the development some of the cases where you don't have as much of a push there. But we've got other cases where the lawyers have their eye on the prize and the client is maybe a little bit more settlement focused, where it opens up some avenues to uh, discuss a meaningful settlement in the case. Gotcha. Yeah. So not having that deadline maybe uh, discourages settlements in some ways, whereas it normally would have been happening sooner. Got it. Um, well, uh, I appreciate you sharing uh, some of those things that are going on right now. And um you know, we're recording this ahead of when uh, people will hear it. Hopefully by then some circumstances will have changed, um, but uh, hard to say right now. So so thanks for that. Well, I do want to let you uh, also just share with the audience uh, a little more about uh, your firm, your practice, uh, and uh, a little about that. So why don't you start there? Sure. So uh, I'm a partner at Fulkerson Lots LLP, and we're really a trial litigation boutique firm uh, here in Houston, Texas. It's a relatively small firm. We have seven attorneys and we have uh, 12 total employees. So uh, we've got horsepower, but on, uh, I started my career at a much bigger firm at Baker Botts in Houston and then right. kind of branched off and, and joined a little bit smaller firm. So our practice really focuses on uh, civil litigation and mostly trials and arbitrations. And it could be any type of case ranging from a breach of contract dispute uh, to a fraud case, a fiduciary duty dispute. We handle a lot of partnership disputes. And since we're in Houston, there's a heavy diet of oil and gas, uh, energy industry cases, as well as some cases in the healthcare industry where there's a commercial dispute between a business or an executive uh, as kind of the bread and butter of our practice on what we do. And then I also do a little bit of work in the intellectual property field, handling trade secret cases, uh, non-compete disputes, as well as some patent and trademark litigation. Yeah, so a pretty full basket there, <laughs> for sure. What's uh, what's been the impact on uh, litigation within energy and oil and gas, just with the recent downturn of pricing and, and that kind of thing? 
Uh, so I'm expecting there's going to be some pretty significant fallout in the Houston energy market. The, the challenge a lot of smaller energy companies have right now is that you've got oil that's basically trading in the $20 a barrel range, West Texas Intermediate Crude. And if that continues for you know six or nine months and you don't get oil prices rebounding, you're going to see probably a, a wave of bankruptcies in the Houston areas among some of the smaller companies. For yeah. some of the larger companies that are better capitalized and have better banking relationships, there may be some opportunities for mergers and acquisitions, but it could be a tough environment in the short term. But for most Texans, they've been through ups and downs in the oil and gas industry, and that's uh, part of the business. It's a volatile industry, and there are peaks sure. and valleys. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, and the it looked like the there were obviously other factors happening, impacting the energy sector before COVID-19 happened, so sort of a double whammy. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you have the Saudis and, and the Russians who basically have driven down the price of oil. And on top of that, you have an erosion of demand in, in the market. And so it is a right. double whammy on kind of uh, both fronts on the supply and the demand side. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you mentioned having started at uh, a large firm, then stepped over to uh, to start your uh, boutique firm. And you did that at a relatively young age, a relatively uh, a small amount of experience, than, uh, maybe than what others have done in the past. What drove you to make that decision at that time? And uh, what now looking back on having done that, what did you learn from that experience? Well, I started at Baker Botts, which was kind of one of the big three firms uh, here in, in the Houston area. And I worked there for a little bit over a year. And then uh, a partner at one of the law firms I'd been a summer clerk at continued kind of recruiting me even after I'd gone to the, the big firm to start the career. And mm. really the, the reason for transitioning, there was great experience at the large firm, but I wanted pretty early advocacy and trial experience. And that was a little bit harder to come by in you know, firms where you're handling $200, $300 million cases at a big firm to be a person who's doing the advocacy work in your first couple of years. And so I had an opportunity to work on really significant legal matters in a huge commercial arbitration for ExxonMobil as a second-year lawyer, but in a small firm environment where I was really the, the second-chair trial lawyer on what was a four-week arbitration uh, in that case and mm. got some great early experience in depositions and trial and opportunities to really kind of personally develop in the cases a little bit faster. Yeah. Do you, for, for those that are maybe thinking about um, making that transition from a larger firm to a smaller one, what are some, you mentioned that being able to get that uh, advocacy experience was a big driver for you. What, what are some factors that they should be thinking about? What, what might they be giving up by leaving a large firm that, 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 uh, that they should be considering as well as some of the pros? Uh, well, what I encourage young lawyers to think about is really their personal kind of capital and their development and what are they doing to build their own skills. And uh, I, I think that there are advantages of large firms. For example, when I was at Baker Botts, you know, there was a program called Dinner Line where you could get your meal brought in if you're working from 5 to 7 p.m. at night and have a hamburger or something else right. to eat. You had a lot of administrative support. You had an overnight you know, dedicated kind of word processing secretary who could get your brief kind of filing ready, uh, you know, uh, overnight while you slept. And so you kind of lose some of those administrative yeah. support functions when you're in a little bit smaller environment. But you also have the flexibility, a little bit more nimbleness and an ability to kind of control your practice in a smaller firm environment. And at the end of the day, I think it's less about kind of the, what size of the firm you have and more about what are you doing to serve clients and continue to develop your own skills. Sure, sure. Well, I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm disappointed. There's no meals being brought in at Fulkers and Lots at 7 o'clock at night right now. Well, we have an equalizer <laughs> called Pizza, Uber Eats, and, uh, and the meal delivery services. So I think we've countered that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think the market has moved towards you on that one. So, so you're in good shape there. Um, well, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, just practicing law in Houston and uh, the Harris County Bar and... Um, I, I know we have a number of listeners in the in the Houston market, but uh, but others around the state that may at some point either want to get there or have a, an openness to to looking at moving to Houston. Um, what are some of the things that are that are good about it? What do you like about it? What's unique about it? Uh, well, Houston's obviously the fourth fourth largest city in the country, and so it's a big legal market. We've got a pretty diverse. Uh, client base since we have a strong energy industry and also kind of strong healthcare industry with a medical center and a lot of technological uh, innovation and small businesses in the Houston area. And so there's a good client base. 
the legal market is pretty collegial. Uh, we've got a huge number of attorneys in Houston. I think the statistics show there are something like 15,000 attorneys in the greater Houston area. But it ends up being a pretty collegial uh, bar, and, and uh, a lot of lawyers work together pretty collaboratively. You've got very talented uh, lawyers and advocates, but you tend to get to know people pretty well. And a little bit fewer sharp elbows compared to maybe the Dallas market or California market or some other uh, big cities around the country where people try to get things done and focus on being a little bit more efficient and work together. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, and that's been, I've uh, experienced in meeting with a number of Houston lawyers over the years. And I think that that's, a, uh, that's my, been my just impression as well, both from those direct conversations and what other people have said uh, as well. So that makes sense. Um, well, now I want to ask you to just think back to when you were first getting into practice and, and some of those first couple of years, you mentioned the year at Baker Botts and then even the first year or two um, in, your, uh, in your new firm at the time. Um, what are a couple of things that, that you learned as a young lawyer that have stuck with you and that are really, you feel like are important pieces of who you are uh, today and moving forward? You know, a couple things stick out. Uh, one, you know, being a lawyer is really a service profession. And so it does involve kind of putting the needs of your, your clients first and really trying to think as a lawyer about how do I put myself in the shoes of the client and figure out what is their budget for dealing with this issue? What is their big picture strategy? What is the path for resolution in a case? Because, Different cases, you know, kind of require different approaches. You have some clients who are small businesses or individual executives who have a more constrained budget for what they do with litigation. And you have other clients who want to take a more aggressive approach. And really, as a lawyer trying to step out of your own shoes and think about how would I approach this if I were the client getting this invoice or paying this bill or thinking about how do I use this litigation to advance my business or to get past a hurdle that I've had in my business is really, I think, the starting point that, that uh, young lawyers should really think about and having a bigger strategic vision on what they want to do in developing clients and helping service those clients. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Um, thinking about the associates that you've worked with over the years as a associate yourself, and then now that you've uh, hired and trained and, and watched other young lawyers as well. Um, what are some ways that a young lawyer can impress uh, their either, you know, senior associates or partners that, that they're working for doing work for? What, what are some things that they really need to be focused in on in those first few years? I would say the, the real key things are attention to detail and really developing a mastery of, of the facts and the law in the case. Uh, one of the, the things that we really focus on is kind of early case assessment to be able to identify, you know, within a month of getting the case, what are the key themes that you're going to need to present your case to either a jury or an arbitrator at trial so you can focus your activity and your work on things that really help drive the resolution of the case rather than just getting distracted in some of the rabbit trails and some of the minutia that can consume the day-to-day the -day practice. So having a little bit of strategic vision and thinking about how am I ultimately going to present this to a jury? What will be credible? What are the key points and the strengths and weaknesses of the case I need to focus on, on developing. And then as an associate, making sure that you turn in kind of focused quality product that is ready to file and gets the, the ball advanced as much as you can. So when another attorney is reviewing that in the firm, they can do that at kind of a strategic level as opposed to, you know, having things that are incomplete or grammatical errors, just making sure that you have a good quality product that you're turning in. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, on the flip side of that, what's, what's sort of some just, uh, don't make this mistake <laughs> type of things that you've witnessed or seen over the years, or maybe done yourself. <laughs> I don't know. Sure. The, the thing I would say is the most important is, is taking responsibility for kind of the work that you're doing. And uh, yeah. in any profession, whether it's law or business, or if you're a, a, a hitter for the Astros or, you know, a, a Houston Rockets guard, making sure that you're controlling the things that are within your area that you can work on to make sure that you're turning in good product and avoiding blaming other people if there's a mistake, making sure that you take ownership of that and you figure out how do I correct this uh, and kind of move forward and, and being honest and open about uh, about issues that come up in your case. So you're adaptable and you don't get kind of locked into uh, an area that get, gets you stuck in an area you can't get out of. Yeah. Yeah. And I will let the Astros one slide. I'll just, <laughs> 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 um, uh, 
so uh, over over the years, we've worked together some on on hiring, uh, and, and as you've interviewed uh, folks uh, and uh, looked for the right people to bring into your firm, um, I want to ask you about that a little bit. Uh, what are some of the key things that you're looking for um, on a on a resume and a cover letter? What are the things that stand out for you? Well, certainly academic qualifiers are an important thing to get in the door. You want people who have demonstrated that they've got a good track record on grades. But really the things that we look for more with our firm being focused on litigation are an advocacy background for the person that we're hiring. And that could be a mock trial. It could be moot court experience in law school. It could be a background in speech and debate, but an ability to clearly communicate with the goal that the people that we hire as a small firm with seven lawyers, we want eventually to become uh, capable kind of first chair trial lawyers who can handle a case on their own. And so we look for people who are well-rounded, who have not only good grades, but people who we think have good interpersonal skills, who can relate well, who we can see giving an effective opening statement or closing argument in front of a jury at the end of the day in trial are really important and kind of differentiators from just what you see on paper versus uh, the person who would be a good fit in our environment. Yeah, yeah. It, how do you go about determining some of those things when you're interviewing a candidate? What what are uh, or is it just sort of a gut feel or, or what are what are some ways that you look for uh, candidates uh, in the interview to show some of those qualities? Well, normally, you know, the interview process uh, that we follow if we're doing an on-campus interview, you usually only have about 20 minutes to talk to a law student, and you might have, you know, five or six of those that are scheduled for one afternoon. So you're really picking up more on the interpersonal communication dynamic that you have with somebody sitting across the table from you. Will they be relatable? Are they confident in kind of their ability to express their vision? And then listening a little bit to what are their short-term and kind of mid-range goals is somebody who might be in law school uh, looking to start a career on, do they have really an interest in litigation? Do uh, Are they comfortable kind of in a speaking capacity? Uh, just some of the cues that you get from nonverbal communication on, is this somebody who is comfortable in their own skin? And we also like to, to hire people maybe who have overcome some kind of obstacle in life, whether it's yeah. being from a small town or maybe not having all the advantages in life, but people who will be self-starters and who will be motivated to perform uh, and who have a degree of independence and a, a, sense, of, a sense of self. Yeah. It, uh, it's funny you mentioned that. Actually, uh, when I would do mock interviews for the law students at Baylor, I would always ask a question about something that they've overcome a diverse, uh, a, a, an overcoming adversity type of, of question. And, uh, it was one of the harder ones for them uh, usually. And then afterwards, a lot of them would ask me why I asked that. <laughs> um, and I would have to tell, like, I know that these types of questions either get asked directly or indirectly because people want to see, you know, when you're in the trenches in a tough environment with a lot of stress on you, how do you respond? How do you react? You know, what's kind of, what are you made of? What's your metal? <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, well, and what if someone is moving over from another firm? So maybe they've been out for a couple of years. Um, does that change any of the calculus as you're looking at either you know, documents or, or doing interviews? What's, what's different maybe about that process? Sure. And uh, we recently hired uh, at the end of the year, beginning of this year, a lateral hire. Most of our prior hiring had been people who'd started with our firm who we'd had in a summer clerkship program as opposed to a lateral hire. Yeah. Uh, when you're looking at hiring somebody from another firm, you have a little bit more of a track record of experience that allows you to assess the credibility of the firms that they've worked at before. What's really important to me is the quality of the experience that they developed at that, that firm. So did they have an opportunity to take depositions, to attend hearings, to be someone who was interacting with the client, and really looking for people who are, are desiring more opportunities to be well-rounded in their practice? And the other thing you can assess with a, a lateral hire is kind of what were they dissatisfied about with the prior firm without violating confidences, but to kind of get a sense of is this a person who had, you know, a conflict that is going to recur in a new environment or is this something that was a one off uh, situation that they're looking for a different path or that their their goals were, were differently aligned. So you just have a little bit longer track record on being able to assess what people have done if they've been practicing for five or seven years, as opposed to somebody who you're hiring for the first time out of law school, who may not have a great sense of what does it mean to be a lawyer and what's the day to day and, and how do things operate? Right. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point about you know making sure because sometimes people get so frustrated with something that's at, that's going on at their current firm 
that they just want to get out and they want to take the first play, you know, place they can go. But there may be a similar structure or issue that's at the new firm, um, and, but they just feel like it's different. So surely it'll be better. And that's not always the case, right? So That's right. And assessing is this a, an optimist who has a, a glass half full mentality uh, versus, you know, somebody who may be dissatisfied with, with things that could recur is, is really important, particularly in a small firm where we have a very collegial environment. We work together closely. Uh, it's very important to make sure the personalities mesh when you're all on one or two floors of your building. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, last thing on this, um, are there any uh, interview red flags, things that just pop up that you just know it's either a mistake they make or just something that, okay, they're, they're not, they're either not ready for this, they're not prepared, or they're just not a good fit, uh, or just any horror story <laughs> that you've had uh, by when you've interviewed someone? I would say the degree of preparation that somebody uh, does going into an interview is a good insight into are they going to prepare for handling their cases. And so when you have a candidate who's kind of read through all the biographies of the lawyers and who has thought about how they fit within the law firm and, and maybe what's unique and different, it's really important to assess if they kind of done their homework and reading about the firm. Because, again, being a small firm, you want to make sure you have a personality fit. You want to make sure you have people who are researchers who are willing to kind of get on and figure out, is this the right environment for me, as opposed to people who are just looking for a job at any firm and kind of fill in the blank. And so the degree of research and preparation and understanding the type of cases and the nature of the practice and people who really have a long-term vision of how they would fit within the environment, what they can contribute, are really important things that can help make people stand out during the interview process. Sure, sure. Um, You would have presumably started this at a, at a relatively uh, early point in your career in terms of developing clients and developing business. Um, what advice do you have uh, to young lawyers about how to start thinking about or going about that process of building those relationships uh, so people can start building uh, books of business as, as young lawyers? The advice I would give is that there are really three sources of business uh, at, at, at law firms, that, particularly small law firms like mine. One is going to be your existing client base, so servicing and taking care of the needs of your existing clients and developing relationships with some of the younger attorneys at some of the larger clients will help uh, grow those relationships and expand work that you're getting. The second one is kind of the word of mouth advertising where people who you're friends with, who you have a social relationship with, or maybe uh, colleagues uh, will be referring business to you and they'll hear about work that you've done on another case and know that you're a lawyer, whether it's a church group or another environment where you're exposed to people who have uh, some business uh, work that they can send your way. And then the third is referrals from other lawyers. And so maintaining yeah. your network of people you've been to law school with, bar functions, and even opposing counsel uh, have sometime come back to our firm and said, we think you did a bang up job in your case. We've got a case we'd like to send to you that we think would be appropriate. And so maintaining those kind of three sources are important and really good for associates to start thinking about developing to be a well-rounded attorney who not only can handle the legal work, but also think about how do I manage this as a business and ensure we got enough flow of work uh, that associates, partners, everyone is contributing to, to bring in high quality business. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned opposing counsel uh, because I think that's one that is maybe not as intuitive uh, uh, to a young lawyer to, to, to know that, uh, I mean, it, it makes sense of course, to, uh, to maintain good relationships with lawyers that you may go against again down the down the line, but from the sense of they may also be referral sources is just another reason to handle yourself professionally, ethically, and all all those things uh, in, in these matters, isn't it? That, that's right. And that is kind of an unusual source, but it's one that from time to time results in some pretty good dividends. And it's a nice endorsement when you can say I was opposite this lawyer on a case and they did a great job and have that as the introduction to uh, to someone in an appropriate case. It doesn't work all the time, but there right. are a lot of other lawyers who you grow to respect and, and think very highly of their capabilities. And if they manage you know, litigation in a professional way and are doing a good job, it's a good reason to refer business to them. Yeah. And kind of outside of the referring business, I've also been hearing just it recently feels like a number of stories of uh, lawyers who were recruited away 
uh, from other firms after going against them <laughs> in, in some type of matter. So it can also be a source of another uh, employment opportunity uh, as well. Um, so always uh, good to keep that in mind. Um, well, uh, the last thing I want to touch on before we start to wrap up here um, is the idea of um, work and life and trying to get all those things uh, together. Some people call it balance. Some people are now calling it harmony or work life, what, however you wanted to phrase it. Um, what have you done with your firm to try to uh, uh, address that issue, if anything? And kind of what are your expectations for young lawyers in your firm and, and how to kind of go about this? Well, work life, work life balance is a, a great but an elusive concept, I think, everywhere. And so it's a goal I think everyone shares, but one of those situations where the devil is in the details on how do you make it happen. And part of that is just, you know, law being a service profession, you do sometimes have to put client needs first. And you may get an email after hours from a client or being deal, dealing with a late night filing where you just need to kind of knuckle down and get the work done. The, the way practically our, our firm deals with that. Uh, a lot of our employees, a lot of the partners at our firm are parents and have families and have other commitments outside of the office. And so part of that is developing a mutual respect and kind of a trust. And if somebody has a family event that they need to attend, giving them a permission to go do that work with the understanding that, you know, they may be available during a time of high need when you're getting ready for a trial and you got to work late nights and, and weekends and kind of be ready to roll. Uh, the people that you tend to be generous towards and giving them flexibility to take time off during a good time tend to be loyal employees who will be there willing to stick up for you during a time when you really have a need. And yeah. to me, the most important thing is making sure that everybody is pulling the oar in the same direction on that, that you see, you know, the partners are willing to make sacrifices. And if the partners do that, the associates tend to do it. And then your support staff and your paralegals tend to get the message that everybody is willing to work hard when necessary, but we're also human beings and we understand that you know, life happens, coronavirus happens from time to time, you got to adjust and adapt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and hopefully, uh, we keep it at once a century. <laughs> <laughs> so we're done with it after this, our, our group. Um, well, uh, before we get to our rapid fire questions here, is there anything that we haven't uh, talked about that you'd want to share with the audience before we before we go? I think we've covered a lot of ground. So let's go into we the have... rapid fire session. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Um, here we go. Name one trait or characteristic you most want to see in an associate. Self-starter is what comes to mind for me. Yeah, good. What habit has been key to your success? I would say early case assessment, getting to know the key issues, both the law and the facts in your case, so you can drive them to resolution quickly. Yeah. Favorite app or productivity tool? Well, you've already given us one, unless you want to give us a new one different one. So I'll give you two. My, my favorite one, I use the iPad a lot for out of client, uh, out of office meetings and Notability is an app that I use to yep. take notes that I think is a great app that allows you to highlight and color and, and really effectively use uh, a mobile device uh, if you're outside the office. And then uh, I've also done some presentations on smart apps for lawyers. And there's a link. Mm. If you go to our website, fulkersonlots.com, uh, I think we've got a link to that presentation. There are like 15 or 20 different lawyer-specific apps that I found useful in practice that uh, are things that range from note-taking to judge information to uh, legal research that are useful. Great. Yeah, we will include all that in the show notes to this episode so people can link and find uh, all those resources. Thanks for letting us know about that. Um, all right. Uh, your favorite social distancing activity? <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a new parent. I've got a two and a half year old twins. So I would say uh, walking in the park with them uh, or playing indoor basketball are probably the two things that have been the, uh, the best outlets at home to try to burn off a little bit of energy before bedtime. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and then lastly, favorite legal movie? I'm going to go with My Cousin Vinny, uh, which is a, a great legal comedy. We quote a lot of lines from that around the office. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a, it's a classic. It was the first one we did on this show way back. Uh, so it's in people's feed right now if you want to go and haven't listened to that yet. Um, and this is a great time to go back and revisit some of those old classics. Um, and uh, so a good one. Uh, good, good choice for sure. Well, Wes, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. And I know you had to do some uh, technical shuffling to be able to be part of this. And I appreciate the effort to do it. I really do. Uh, and our audience, I know, 
does as well. So thanks for being with us and best of luck to you and your firm and everything you have going on. Thanks very much, Daniel. It's a pleasure talking to you and I appreciate your, your time and effort today. All right. My thanks again to Wesley Lotz for joining us on the show today. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider doing two quick things? Would you subscribe so you don't miss an episode? And then also, would you rate and review the podcast in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? If you have suggestions or thoughts about the show, or if I could help you in any way, please email me directly at daniel at varsitysearch.com. Also, just a last reminder, if you or someone you know might be interested in the role at Hedrick Kring, associate attorney with two to five years experience, please email me daniel at varsitysearch.com or go apply to the position at varsitysearch.com or on our LinkedIn page. All right, that's it for today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Thanks again so much to each of you for listening. I'm Daniel Hare with Varsity Search, and we'll talk with you next time. 